Hi, I'm Ed Dressel. The November What's Neat starts right now. This is What's Neat for November 2016. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month, Hollywood actor Michael Gross stops by the studio and gives us a really short interview about his modeling experiences. He ran a few trains and felt right at home as he watched What's Neat this week pretty much every month, and he was familiar already with operating my layout. He was so gracious and friendly as everyone took turns getting a selfie photo as you see Jeff Meyer and Michael setting up this shot. We were just having fun with a fellow modeler. For tool tips this month, we show how to use an oscillating sander to easily shake our modeling paint prior to airbrushing. For this month's layout construction segment, we refinish an existing folding trade show layout for Athern and then we deliver it to a trade show. Also this month, Matt Herman from ESU Loak Sound demonstrates, explains, and shows how his line of sound decoders can enhance our operating experience. And that's the lineup for this November 2016 What's Neat. I don't know. Hey, can you yeah. guys shake these bottles of paint for me? They've been like ready. five years. They haven't been shook up. All right. So, just need a little help with that. Boy, it sure would be nice if there was some way to shake. Yeah, we have to stop doing this. Yeah, like doing that. Shake it, shake it, shake it up. Now what? Now I'm going to get all big enough to do that. If there was only some kind of machine that someone could invent. Well. I know we should be over Patterson's house. He's probably got something figured out. Stir this here. No, you try we'll that. I'll try this. We'll see. He wants yeah. to know everything about it, so that's what we do. All right, we'll, we'll just keep shaking. Okay, hey, what's that? What the? Hey, you stole our idea. You guys got them bottles shook up yet? Well, I think I do. Yeah. Huh? Oh, I'm sure I oh. do. Huh? Let's just do my own little test here. Nope. This is an inferior job. No, I still got slug. And so just like that, you can shake up a bottle of paint with a simple tool. These little oscillating sanders. I could see at some point making a clamp on, rivet on clamp where you could clamp the bottle of paint into the shaker Let's and actually have a product yeah, that's saleable done. to be okay. clipped onto one of these devices. Is this the one you just did? Yeah, it's well, just. Let's see how, how good that is. Yeah. You say five years? All of us? Oops. So no fuss, and no muss, and no, no work, mess. And no work. Just by doing it that way. It, I gotta tell you what, I think that's another tip on what's neat, huh? Yeah. Just hit the shake this segment of What's Neat, I've got Michael Gross in the studio today and uh, I thought we'd just talk about trains and find out why is it that Michael Gross is involved in the hobby. Was it, what is it that got you interested in this hobby, Mike? Uh, my grandfather worked 56 years for the Atchison Speak in Santa Fe. Okay. And um, he was a, um, a switch engine foreman, a hostler. Uh, and uh, uh, among other things, and uh, he worked in the shops at Fort Madison, Iowa, shopped in Iowa, which at that point was the division point between the Illinois and Missouri divisions, uh, and then it was finally combined in about 1955 or something, into one great division, 
from Chicago to Kansas City, but he was a railroader for 56 years. His father before him worked for the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, the CB&Q, and the Santa Fe Railway. And he was a boilermaker, and my understanding was a very, very good boilermaker when he was sober. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And um, he went back and forth from the, uh, from the Santa Fe to the uh, CB&Q because uh, he kept, uh, he kept laying off every time he'd get a paycheck. <laughs> go on a, a three-day drunk and he'd come back and they'd fire him and he'd, he kept going back and forth because apparently he was such a good boilermaker, they kept taking him back after he had dried out a little bit. So, um, so I come from a long line of drunks. Well, Ken. following the family here, because you should be working for the railroad then. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and should be drinking right now, which I'm not. Where's the... At any rate. Um, uh, I did go to work for the uh, Chicago Northwestern Railroad okay, in 1967. I had to get it out of my blood. I was working my way through college, and it was a great way to great way to go. A lot of people hiring out as switchmen and brakemen, and uh, I uh, kept bugging the chief master mechanic until he gave me a job on a locomotive. And so I was a one of the last card-carrying members of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen and Enginemen before they were absorbed into the BLE, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. So when did the trains come in? The models hit you. The models really started because I was so close to my grandfather. I mean, I I loved the guy. Okay. I really did. I came to associate what he did with how much I cared for him. And so I was trained crazy from that, from the time I was an infant. Uh, there's, a grand, there's a story my uh, uh, grandmother tells about uh, how I would play outside the play outside their house and knock on the knock on the door, knock on the front door, and she'd answer, and I'd say, "The engineer wants a sucker." <laughs> and so, at four, at age four, that was all I wanted to do. And all through the '50s and the '60s, when everybody else wanted to be astronauts, no, I still wanted to work for the railroad. And look, look what happened to me. Yeah. I wound up doing something completely different. Different. And I've have, never have played, played a locomotive. Have you, no, no, have you done no. that? Okay. Should have been on Petticoat Junction. Something, something like that, or that Back to the Future, or something <laughs> like that. Okay. So, um, I guess you're here for the Prototype Modelers Meet. Uh, how'd you enjoy that show this weekend? I really did. This was my first time to St. Louis Collinsville, and, uh, you know, I know there are, uh, there are some hardcore people there, and I learn something great from them all the time. I myself am probably not, I couldn't call myself a prototype modeler. I take aspects of the prototype. I beg, borrow, and steal. I'm an illusionist. It's like okay. what I do for a living, right? You sure. know, I'm creating the perfect illusion. Everything does not have to be in place as long as I make people think it's in place, okay. you know. So you know how it is. On the stage, the other side of the flat is a completely blank, you know. Uh, you step out of the set and it's all wood and bracing and uh, none of it's real and so that's that's how I think of model railroading too. Wow. You know I mean the yes. presenting a perfect illusion. And there's so many modelers out there would like to be in that type of industry because they think that the one they're building models all day well I can you know build those things I could do that Hollywood work. Well they're, they're a good number of talented people and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they got businesses they out there. Yeah. And it's a pleasure being here with you I've seen your show for a long time and seen your work on online and, uh, and in print. No, I appreciate that. Maybe in the future we can get you to do a segment on something, one of your special interests that you have in the hobby. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, for us and being on the show just for a few minutes. Absolute pleasure. It's a pleasure, pleasure meeting you, Mike. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. Okay. Same here. segment of What's Neat, you'll remember this folding trade show display layout that Athern sets up to run trains when they do a, a trade show. And this layout has come back to my studio recently to just kind of give it a little bit of a makeover. Make sure everything's working good on it, give it some new power feed wires. And I was also instructed to take the sides of it, this beautiful oak that has been stained with a natural color uh, clear coat and make it black. Give it that old stereo equipment look of the, uh, you know, the 70s where it's just black, 
high gloss and then you can just see the wood grain in it. And I think that'll look really nice. I sanded the woodwork of the layout with an electric oscillating sander. Now this didn't damage any of the scenery and it kept the dust to a minimum. I used Minwax Poly Shade Stain and Polyurethane Mixture, Classic Black, High Gloss, working my way around the entire layout, careful not to get any of the black on the scenery. I used a 20 inch painter's mask to aid in this process. It took about an hour to color the woodwork. The layout started to take on a very professional and pleasing look. The black sides framing the scenery completely changes the layout's appearance in a good way. I applied the same black finish to the outside woodwork of the folding layout to give it that finished look. Turning my attention to the power feed wiring, I drilled holes into a sheet of brass stock, one in the center to accept a guitar jack, and four holes, one on each corner, for mounting screws. I test fit the female two conductor guitar jack into the brass faceplate. I then drilled holes into the layout to mount the brass plate and run the wires. I snaked the wires from the corner of the layout to the track. Running the wire under the fake fur was a simple way of accomplishing this task. Using a pencil tip iron, I soldered the wires to the female guitar jack power leads using rosin core solder. I then moved on to solder the other end of the wires to each of the rails on the layout. The wires will be hidden from view with a little fresh ballast. Using a buffing wheel attached to a Dremel, I polished the brass faceplate to a reflective mirror finish. I attached the faceplate to the bottom of the layout with four one quarter inch black screws. The male guitar jack simply fits into the faceplate, providing the layout with power. Refinishing the scenery involved repairing a few cracks in the ballast by simply applying new ballast and gluing it into place with a good soaking of Woodland Scenics Scenic Cement, which should prevent further cracking. I vacuumed the layout, cleaned the track, and test ran a locomotive around the entire layout just to make sure everything ran smooth so that when it is set up at its first train show appearance at the 2016 NMRA National, it'll look good. Jeff Otto helped me fold up the layout and then we loaded it into my truck on a nice soft blanket for the road trip. The 250 mile drive from St. Louis to Indianapolis, Indiana was enjoyable. And to me, it really wasn't long enough because I love driving my truck and just letting my mind wander into thought. Once at the show, I was escorted into the convention center, truck and all. Once parked at the Atherin booth, the crew were ready to unload the layout onto the trade show floor. Upon setting the layout up in place and opening it up, it looked fresh and new, as I had Chris Palomares' seal of approval ready to display Atherin trains to all the wonderful model railroaders attending the NMRA train show. And that ends this layout construction segment on What's Neat. This segment of What's Neat, I've got Matt Herman from ESU from Look Sound Electronics. Now on the show we featured TCS, is that the name of the company? And then we've featured, featured Soundtracks and Tsunami 2 and Tsunami 1 decoders. And today we're going to talk about the Look Sound decoder. So with the show, we're getting a equal time to understand each system. There's no such thing as one's better than the other. Each system's different in how you use your layout, is what I've come to discover. So let's get an education and learn all about Look Sound today. Matt, it's all yours, baby. 
Well, Ken, um, I want to kind of introduce myself to your crowd a little bit. Um, you know, you have some, some really good viewers, and uh, I want them to make sure that they know who I am, a little bit about my history, and you know, what makes uh, ESU just a little bit different. And um, I tend to, for whatever reason, just luck of the draw, I tend to be the face behind ESU, and I'm, I'm sorry for all your viewers, I've got that face for radio. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, my history is that I come from Bowser, and there are people who know that. Um, I've, I've been the project manager for Bowser for uh, five or six years, executive line projects and all of that was, was kind of my baby as I got started. Before that, my father was the chief mechanical officer for a railroad in Pennsylvania, so I was up running trains before you know, I could drive. Um, you know, I was, I was riding trains in my mother's womb. I have pictures of myself getting on the CN 6060 in Toronto, Ontario. And, um, it's just been a, my life has been about trains. It's, it's not a job to me by any means. This is my lifestyle. It is, I eat, sleep, and breathe trains, and whether my wife likes it or not. <laughs> How many years have you been in this industry? Um, it's probably going on about 15 now between uh, Bowser and uh, ESU. So you've got a good feel for things. I do. Yeah. Now this Lok sound, this is a whole other sound system, decoder. Uh, what is the magic of Lok sound? Well, um, it's a German company. They base themselves out of Ulm, Germany, which is South Central Germany. And their main focus before sound is actually motor control. So um, anything having to do with DCC, we create. We have our own command stations. Uh, we have our own detectors and switch machine decoders. And now we're coming out with something called a signal pilot, uh, which will have uh, the logic to run all your signaling systems. Um, but one of the differences, the main differences, I'd even say, between ESU decoders and a lot of the other prominent sound decoders in the market right now is the fact that our decoders are programmable. So you're not stuck with what you bought out of the box. Um, if you don't like it, if there's an update, we just released a new feature set called Full Throttle, uh, which I'm hoping to talk about in maybe a future episode. Um, that feature set is available from decoders that we made in 2009. When you put that in there, it's like a brand new decoder. But you didn't have to tear your engine apart. You didn't have to break all your handrails or mar up all your weathering. Okay. And you simply put it on the programmer and bang, it's done. It's so you're, you're brand doing, new you've decoder. created a platform that's upgradable, that's is what right. you're saying. That's right. And then it applies to sound. You can change the sound. You can, so really, okay. So you can actually record onto it. What, do you download this off the internet? We have two different types of decoders. I'm glad you asked that question. We have a 4.0 and we have a select. Now all the decoders that we provide for manufacturers are select decoders. Okay, and preset. Those, that's right, they're okay. preset. That's a great way to put it. I look at it in terms of, one is you're ordering off the value menu. Um, and those, those numbers on that value menu are already made. You get what that number is. The other one's ordering off a smorgasbord. You get to go around, that would be the 4.0. You get to go around and you get to pick and choose, well, I want, I want this horn and I want that prime mover and I want that air compressor and I want this you know, set of brake squeals. And, and that's what you can do with a 4.0. Let me Plus, understand something here. You lost me. Sure. I'm in the hobby shop and I, I want to buy a low sound decoder. Right. So do I just buy a decoder and I take it home and it can be steam or diesel or is it going to come already? Well, and see, that's, Steam or diesel. that's a lot of the misconception that's out there. Um, it's another really good point. You're, boy, you're leading this well. <laughs> well, I, I want to know these things, No, these right? are great questions. I, I, I want to know. You can buy every Elk Sound decoder pre-programmed, whether it be a 4.0 or a Select. If you go to your dealer and you know what you're going to be putting it into, he can provide that already programmed, whether he programs it himself or whether he buys it from us programmed. Okay. Um, but with the low programmer, the device that you load the sounds with onto the decoder, that's a, I like, like to call that, that's a get to, that's not a got to. You okay. do not have to have a low programmer to use ESU decoders. You get to, because you get to put your own sounds on it. That 4.0, you could go out and record your own locomotive and create a sound file and put it on yourself. So if I go to Mark Twain Hobby, that's the hobby shop we got in here sure. in town. I go to the hobby shop and I say, hey guys, I want a low sound decoder. I will be able to pick either steam, diesel, or one that could be anything I want it to be. If you go to our website, loksound.com, L-O-K-S-O-U-N-D, um, there'll be a download section. And you just go through that download section and pick whatever prime mover, very specific prime movers, 567B 16 cylinder, or 567BC 16 cylinders. Okay. But you, you type, basically, you type in the engine type that you want. I want an F7A. 
and you type in F7A and it'll come up with all the appropriate sound files for that F7A. You go to your hobby shop with that number and say, this is what I want on okay. an 8 pin decoder, on a 9 pin decoder, on a, on a 21 pin decoder, whatever your, your uh, fancy might be for that engine. On See what's that? neat this week, it's not about who makes a better product, it's not about what's better, it's about what's out there, educate me equally, right. show me every manufacturer, give every manufacturer a fair shake right. to explain to us what it is, because it's so much about understanding, and with electronics, I'm kind of dumb. Well, and, and that's, if, if there's a downfall in our industry, I think, especially when it comes to DCC, it's just education. Right. Education of DCC and how it works, and education of the prototype. So that's kind of the mission that I'm on a little bit right now, is to try to educate people on both of those things. Right. So, um, so you've asked about the back EMF style or automatic notching. Ours is not using that type of method. We did that on purpose. Um, and, and you kind of alluded as to why, because there's a lot of people out there that want to have the control of what notch to be in. They've, they've been around railroads their entire life, they're hardcore operators and they really want it to sound a certain way at a certain time and they want to be able to choose that. And back EMF doesn't really allow for that. It's, it's already, it's got its own brain and it's kind of deciding based on the weight of that train, that, that physical train, then this is what it's going to do. Right. Our way is a little bit different. We call it full throttle, and we have a feature called drive hold. It's a single button that we turn on and off, and I can demonstrate that at some point here today, but um, that button locks the motor speed. So when that speed is locked, the throttle itself becomes the instrument, and I can play that instrument at any note that I want to, okay. whether it be in coast or whether it be in notch two, notch three, notch four, uh, we have different levels of acceleration, so I can go straight up to 8 with that throttle, or I can slowly go up depending on how I move my throttle. So if I want a power break, I can do that. If I want a wheel slip, I can do that. If I want to coast through a yard, give it two or three notches, come back, I can do that. But I'm choosing, because only I know what's in those closed cars. If it's a box car and it's loaded or it's empty, the only way I know that is what's on my car card. Correct. The decoder can't know what's that, what's in there, what's not in there. It, you know, a, a load for a box car could be a hundred tons worth of weight. So you start adding that up into a train, that's a lot. But the decoder only knows the true physical weight of that car. Our imaginations are telling us whether or not that's loaded or whether that's empty. So the hardcore operators are going to be able to see that and be able to judge and adjust that for themselves, not just allow the decoder itself to do it. So that's one of the reasons that we did it a little wow, bit. Wow, Matt, you're in Missouri, man. <laughs> this is a show me state. Sure. Can you show me? Can I you show us? Can. The words are awesome. Show me. I absolutely can. All right. Okay, Ken, let's discuss what full throttle does. Cool. Full throttle gives us the ability to completely separate the sound from the motion. And as a, as a prototype modeler, that can become really fun because, you know, so many of us have gone down and sat trackside and we've watched somebody switch cars and, um, you know, they rev it up and they, they really get it going hard and then they kick it down to idle and they coast it out and come to a break next to the train and, and make for a smooth couple. Um, we can do that really, really well with full throttle. So to demonstrate that, basically full throttle is F9 by default. That can be put anywhere since 2009. We've had very, very free and open function mapping. Every button can do anything any of the other buttons can do. And even if another button's already pressed, you know, it's looking for that. It's, um, there's a lot of that stuff there. Go to our, uh, go to our website and look under the uh, full throttle and the, uh, the function mapping videos that we have there. That'll explain that stuff a little more for you. Um, we want to watch trains. We don't want to hear me talk. So, um, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to press F9, and F9 will lock the motor at whatever speed that it's going. So if I'm sitting still, it would be able to ramp up and down just like I were running through the notches in, in idle, or I'm sorry, in, in neutral in, in essence. Um, if I get it moving and I lock it, it's going to lock at whatever speed I, I press it at. So to demonstrate, we've got a Conroe GP38 here. I just coupled up to a car. We're getting ready to pull the industry. So I'm going to, without pressing my drive hold or if full throttle or F9, I'm just going to slowly increase the throttle. Release the brakes. It's going to start moving. Give it a little bit of throttle. We're gonna give it a little goose, get it going. And then at the speed that I'm comfortable with, I'm gonna press F9. Now it's gonna stay at that speed no matter what I do. 
Now I'm pulling a little bit of a grade here. We've got a load that we've picked up, so I'm gonna notch it up, and you're gonna notice as I do, the speed doesn't change. It just remains the same. And I can go to whatever notch I feel is appropriate for the load that I'm pulling. Now, if I wanna increase my speed, I press F9 again, and all of a sudden the motor is gonna to try to catch up to what the, the, uh, the sound is doing. So my throttle is at 24 out of 128. So if I press F9, the speed is gonna to try to catch up to 24 out of 128. So I'll release it, and you'll notice I'm gradually getting a little faster. Maybe I've got enough I can just coast through the switch now. So I'm gonna knock it back to zero out of 128. My full throttle is still on, so I'm just drifting. My drive hold is there. So I'm just drifting and coasting until I'm through the switch. Now, if I wanna slow down, I'm at zero, so I press F9 and I just coast it out. And by pressing F9 on and off, I can now adjust my momentum. If I'm pulling a heavy train, I can slowly increase my momentum. If I'm a light engine or just pulling one car, I can turn that off and then go with the actual momentum that's in the decoder. So let me throw some switches here so we can get back to our train. Reverse direction. Give it a little kick. Press F9 when I'm at the comfortable speed. And coast it out. If you've spent much time next to the tracks, especially in slow speed moves like this, you're oftentimes in coast or in idle more than you're actually in one of the notches. So this gives us the ability to do that a little bit more. So I'm at pretty flat track now. So I'm gonna cheat here a little bit, even though we're not stopping, I'm gonna jump off and throw that switch so we can pull that later. Ring my bell, cause we're going through a unprotected crossing. There's a flagman there, he's just really little, you can't see him on camera. Maybe I need a little more to get all the way back to my train. I can bump it up. Remember, my drive hold is still on, so I'm not increasing speed, just throttle notch. My cars are getting close here, so I'm gonna start slowing down by just, I'm at zero on the throttle, and I just feather that drive hold on and off so that I can come in to a nice smooth stop. Maybe not real smooth, but uh, we didn't flatten too many wheels with that little move. So now I'm, on my, I'm up against my train. I've got about, I don't know, eight or nine cars here, and we want to make sure that the air is okay. So the air is bled off. We want to pump up the air, do a little bit of a brake check, and then we can take off. So with my drive hole button on, now I'm locked at zero. I'm locked at stop. So I can run the, the uh, prime mover up to roughly notch three. And in most EMDs, notch three is about the optimum notch that we want to be in to do an air test because it's a shaft-driven air compressor. And if, it's, if the prime mover is going a little faster, the air compressor is going faster. It's pumping up the air a little faster. Now, after notch three, you're really not getting any more air out of it. There's only so much volume in the line. So notch three is typically where you do, do a brake test. So you hear it's pumped up. So everything's good in the back, so they tell me I'm all right. So now I can just knock that back down to zero on the throttle. It brings it down to idle again. My conductor gets back up here so we can get going. I press F9, release that drive hold. And now I've got a heavy train, so there's a couple ways we can do this. I can press F9 and we can ramp it way up so then we can get going hard and, and pull on a heavy train. We can apply the brakes, which is now F10 by default, and then release the brakes once we get enough you know, buildup of the prime mover. Or I can goose the throttle, and if I do it quickly, the prime mover will build up more quickly before it allows it to move. We have something called drive hold or uh, start delay, I'm sorry, and built right into the prime mover sounds. So the, the engine won't actually move if that's turned on until a period of time is expired, meaning that I can build up the prime mover 
a little bit or I can build it up a lot based on how quickly I move my throttle. So in this case we got a heavy train, I want to build it up a lot. So I'm just going to goose the throttle hard and I can go all the way to 99, get it going, press that drive hold and now I'm locked at that speed even though the prime mover is really working hard. Now pulling that hard I might have broken a knuckle or something so we may not want to go all the way to 8 but now I'm at 28 speed steps out of 128 can really work hard like it's really fighting that heavy train slowly release my drive hold gain a little bit of speed a little momentum maybe I need a little more if I throttle that back and forth I can get a little wheel slip out of it Once I get the momentum that I want, get the speed that I want, I can cut that back to where I would like it to go. Because I know if all of those cars are loaded or empty, the decoder can't know that. It's, it's a closed car. It can only know what the weight of the car is. I've got the car cards. I know that those are all loads so I can make that work harder. And that's the great advantage of full throttle. Matt, I'm probably going to have to watch this whole segment over yeah, again sure. to absorb the, the locomotive types and exactly what I'm looking at to get my head around this. But what I'm seeing is overwhelmingly cool. I like it. Well, and you know, my main mission is education. And, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share that information with your viewers. Um, if they'd like to go to our website, they can go to www.locsound.com, L-O-K-S-O-U-N-D. And they can listen to sound samples of all of the stuff that we've talked about here. www.locsound.com. Correct. Okay, and is that also the same website where you can upload and get the That's where sounds? you get the downloads and the, uh, there's a lot of other information. All of our manuals are there. Okay. Um, all of the information about our other products are there as well. Okay, well, super good. Thank you for coming by. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Have a great day.